The most critical component of any smart home is the network. Just about every device nowadays is controllable or can communicate over Wi-Fi or other means. Having a stable, robust, and fast network gives us a solid foundation with which to begin adding all of our devices. In this episode of Designing the Ultimate Dream Smart Home, we'll talk about the network. My name is Steve, and this is IT Alchemy. In our ultimate smart home, there will be a lot of devices that will require power, connectivity, and be located all over the house, even outside. Luckily, we can provide power and connectivity using power over ethernet. PoE sends power and network communication over a single ethernet cable up to 100 meters. This is a much simpler solution than providing network connectivity over wireless and running power all over the place. We'll have a single cable from the device to a PoE capable network switch located in a central location. Since we have all these cables coming into a central location and we have quite a few devices that the cables are gonna be plugged into, we're gonna to need to organize. We don't want gateways and switches sitting on the shelf or on the floor, and that means we'll need a network rack. A network rack is a standardized enclosure for housing rack mountable equipment. Pretty much any rack mountable equipment will be about 19 inches wide and fit perfectly into one or more slots or rack units. Each rack unit is about 1.75 inches high. Some equipment fits into one U or two U and some more. This lets us calculate exactly how tall our rack needs to be. Based on the equipment that we're gonna be putting in our ultimate smart home, we won't need nearly a floor rack, but there is a lot of cabling coming in and I like having room to expand. So we'll go with a full 42 U rack. Inside the rack, we're going to have our network gear and other equipment to help run the home. First, we'll have an internet connection. This is a cable modem on a 2 gigabit per second connection provided by my ISP. In the future, when fiber is available, this can be upgraded to as high as 10 gigabits a second. A lot of ISP provided modems are also Wi-Fi routers and switches, and that's great if you want an all-in-one device, but we have our own routers and switches, so this will be configured in gateway-only mode. Gateway only mode bypasses the routing and switching functionality and just passes the traffic straight on through. The modem itself connects to the WAN port of our Dream Machine Pro. Right now, we'll connect it to the Ethernet WAN port, but if we get a fiber internet connection, we can utilize the SFP WAN port. This device functions as a router, firewall, and a software control plane all in one for all of our Ubiquiti equipment. I did a deep dive on this in a previous video, and if you didn't catch it, check it out here. The UDM Pro will be seeing all of the traffic that comes in and out of our network. We don't want to bottleneck it, so we're going to connect it to our first switch using the SFP port using a direct attached cable or DAC. A DAC cable on an SFP port will allow the traffic to pass through it up to 10 gigabits a second. Since we have a lot of connections to make, we'll need a big switch. In fact, we're going to need two. The Ubiquiti Pro Max 48 PoE is a 48 port switch with a combination of PoE plus and PoE plus plus gigabit and 2.5 gigabit ports and four 10 gigabit SFP ports. All of the cable runs from our devices will feed into these switches, but not directly. We'll have two 24 port patch panels for each switch. Each space in the panel has a keystone where on one end of the cable, a run will be terminated. And this lets us secure and label each individual run. The other end of the cable uh, will be a keystone with a regular ethernet jack. A short patch cable from the jack to a port on the adjacent switch will connect the far end device. Now, you may be wondering why we don't just put an RJ45 connector on the end of the cable run and plug it into the switch. That's totally possible, but there's a couple of reasons why you shouldn't. One, the cabling in the walls and the ceilings is fixed and should be generally be solid core cabling. This is much less pliable than stranded cabling, and it's also a bit more difficult to terminate into uh, an RJ45 connector. In general, you'll have a solid core run from the device to the patch panel, and a stranded patch cable from the patch panel to the switch, and an RJ45 coupler on the other end of the cable with a stranded patch cable connecting to the device. Two. If the cable run is terminated into a patch panel, that's much easier to trace which cable goes to what and when it's labeled on the patch panel rather than unbundling everything to see if there's a label on it. 
Additionally, this reduces the amount of bend and strain on the cable run, which prevents damage and replacement. Nobody likes repulling a long cable run. Thirdly, it keeps things neat and organized. We're not spending all this time, effort, and money to have a rack that looks like crap. Next up, we have the Ubiquiti NVR Pro. This is a network video recorder that we'll use to store all of the video from our security cameras. It can handle up to 24 4K cameras and have enough storage for about 30 days. Since this device will have a lot of traffic, we'll connect it to the switch using the 10 gig SFP port as well. For additional storage, we'll also have a Ubiquiti UNAS Pro. This is a network storage appliance that can store all of our files, pictures, videos, backups from our other devices. Now, the UNAS Pro is not the most feature-rich storage solution out there, but all I really need is file storage. I don't plan on running other applications on the NAS, and there are other devices for that. Since this can be a high bandwidth consumer, we'll also connect it to one of the switches with the 10 gig SFTP port. Now, there's something a little different below here. We have a Ubiquiti AI key. You'll notice that the device is only about a third of the width of normal rack appliances. There's a mounting option that lets you space up to three AI keys in a standard 1U rack space. And based on our, use, our usage, we're only going to need one of these, but there's room to grow if we ever want to scale up. Now, you might be thinking, we have G6 cameras and those all have AI features built in. Is the AI key really necessary? While it's true that the G6 cameras do have native AI detections built in, the AI key can extend that functionality of those and even other non-AI cameras. For example, with AI cameras alone, you can use the basic search terms like person or car to detect uh, specific audio events or set standard alarms based on motion or object detection and perform facial recognition. However, with the AI key, these features are added to and enhanced, such as allowing more descriptive search terms like uh, FedEx truck or person wearing a blue hat, automatic narrative summaries of events, uh, speech detection with transcription, custom alarms using descriptive natural language, and even advanced facial detection. This is good because we want the cameras to be able to recognize us and not other people. That's pretty much it for the core of the equipment. We'll also have a rack server, which will be something like a Dell PowerEdge R760 for running our applications, uh, Home Assistant, Docker, other things, as well as a couple of shelves and a few other things for small dedicated appliances that aren't really rack mountable. So now that we have everything set up, how do we power all this stuff? Well, there's two components for power. The first is a distribution unit to plug everything into. For this, we'll use the Ubiquiti Power Distribution Pro. It has 16 remotely resettable power outlets and four outlets that are wide spaced, as well as four USB-C power ports. This will let us plug in all of our devices in a nice and organized way, and we'll be able to remotely power cycle these devices as well. Some devices like the UDM Pro, the two switches, the NVR, the NAS, these are all critical components. If any one of them loses power, it'll significantly impact the operation of the network. To solve this, we'll have two Ubiquiti power backup units. These act as redundant power supplies and connects to a separate DC power connection on the back of those critical devices. One thing I'd like to point out is that the power backup units aren't batteries themselves and they don't provide power to the devices. These are just redundant power supplies in the event that the main power cables get shut off or unplugged. If we recall from our previous video on electrical, the home will have battery backup, so these devices should stay online in the event of a power outage. For each location with a wired device, uh, where the device will reside, we'll have a, what's called a premise run or a solid core CAT6A cable that runs back to the equipment rack. On the patch panel side, it'll be terminated with a keystone jack, and on the device side, it'll be terminated with a coupler. Patch cable connects the keystone to the switch, and another patch cable connects the device to the cable run. This way, once the cable is installed in the wall, we shouldn't ever have to touch or disturb it. In our bedrooms, our workrooms, and other areas of the house, we'll have a run that connects to a remote switch. The Ubiquiti Flex switch is a five port PoE switch that can be powered remotely from our other equipment in the rack. These will provide additional connectivity for things like laptops and desktops and printers or anything else that we want to connect to the network via ethernet cable. For wireless connectivity, we'll have three Ubiquiti U7 Pro access points. These will be staggered between the first and the second floors. 
each about a quarter divide of the house. These access points will provide ample coverage across our 2.4, 5, and even 6 gigahertz bands. For Zigbee devices, we'll be using the Sonoff Zigbee Plus USB 3 dongle. This is a Zigbee coordinator that can act as a gateway to uh, a network of Zigbee devices. It's cheap, it's reliable, and it works well with Home Assistant via the Zigbee 2 MQTT atom. I don't plan on using any Z-Wave devices at present, but we'll include the Zoos 800 Z-Wave dongle just in case. This will allow us to add Z-Wave devices at a later time if we feel the need to. So now we have a plan for a solid, stable network where most of the important devices are hardwired and powered remotely via power over Ethernet. Our wireless network has a large coverage area and a limited number of devices to provide more reliability. Would you do anything differently? Let me know in the comments. And as always, please remember to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Stay tuned for the next video where we'll talk about controlling the ultimate dream smart home. Thanks for watching.